If you have your Bibles, turn in them with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And uh, while you're turning there, I will say that uh, Josh told me tonight I can take some of this time for presidential update. And I said, what is that? He said, I don't know. If you got something to say, go ahead and say it then. And uh, that's, a, that's a dangerous proposition to give to somebody. Um, but, but the update I want to give, we could talk about how we're up in enrollment right now. We could talk about the new online program we've been working on. Uh, what, what I would rather talk about is, as I look out and see a lot of you, I saw a list of 55 names this week of people who are graduating. And that's one of the happiest, saddest times of the year for me when I see that list and I think about all the people that we've built relationships with, all the people who've been trained in the Bible and in theology who are now leaving us, which is sad to see. And yet that's why you came. You came to get trained so that you could go and you could scatter and you could go to the nations and make much of Christ. And so when I think of, of a chapel in the spring, I think about the people we're going to be losing at the end. But it excites me about the people that God will put behind you, the ones who will follow in your footsteps. And we're praying great days ahead for Phoenix Seminary. Uh, it's, a, it's a great joy of mine to serve in this role. And, um, and I'm happy to be able to bring the word to you tonight. So we're in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Before we begin, let's call upon the Lord for his assistance. Father, who is worthy to stand and to open your word and to preach? Uh, not me. In fact, no one. If it weren't for the Lord Jesus Christ, you have seen fit to put the tr- precious gospel message in jars of clay and then chosen to make those jars of clay useful in your service. And, and that's who we are. We're a room full of people who feel called out by you to do the mission that the Lord Jesus Christ has given, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that Christ has commanded. Lord, we're not worthy for this task. Tonight, I'm not worthy for this task, but I thank you for the privilege and the honor of the call to do it. And I thank you for these brothers and sisters who have a call from you on their lives, that you will strengthen them and that you will give them courage for the days ahead. Praise in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I want to start with confession time, if that's okay. We did that before. I'm going to add one. Uh, When when I was uh, asked to preach chapel, let me rewind. Josh is like, you weren't asked. When I said, hey, I want to preach chapel, and I'm the president, so let's make that happen. And and so I said, I want to preach, and and I knew what I wanted to preach already, and I wanted to preach on uh, the idea of courage, and then Southwestern Seminary said, hey, we want you to preach, and I thought, what am I going to say to that group? And I I immediately said, the same thing I want to say to our students. You put me in front of any group of seminary students right now, and what I want to say to them is this going to take a lot of courage in the days ahead to stay faithful to the gospel of Christ. It's going to take a lot of courage to do the work of ministry in the day and age that we find ourselves in and the challenges that are on the horizon. In fact, not so much on the horizon now as right in front of our eyes. And the courage that we're going to need to do that, I think we see found in chapter one of 2 Timothy. It's a desperate need for our day. We are losing, as Christianity, home field advantage in the West, and that's okay because the church has often found herself not in home field advantage and the church has found herself at her best when she's not experiencing the home field advantage. But it is a battle. It becomes a sort of war zone and wars demand courage. And there's no shortage of calls to courage in scripture, but there seems to be an absence of calls to courage today. So I see mudslinging, lots of mudslinging that's masquerading as courage. I see a lot of Christians spewing things that are on Christ-like in the name of courage, but I see very little of true, genuine, biblical courage in our day. It's an almost all forgotten virtue. We talk a lot about truth and love and we should talk about those things, but it's courage that is going to let us use those. It was a foundational virtue even in the ancient world. When you think about what did the people in the ancient world think, these were the four big virtues that people need to exercise. There was four cardinal virtues that have, uh, at least these words have fallen by the wayside and I think that the concepts have fallen by the wayside as well. Virtues like temperance, 
which is moderation in all things. Look, we don't live in a temperate society at all anymore. It is indulge and, and, and use and suck it all up as much as possible. No temperance. Temperance is weakness. Uh, get everything you can. That virtue has disappeared. Prudence, the governance of knowledge and wisdom over life. Hopefully you've recognized as a seminary student that that's found in God's word alone for true wisdom and knowledge in our day. Justice. Justice is not in short supply talked about today, but when you think about justice, we see the image ensconced in the lady justice who holds the scales in her hands with a blindfold over her eyes, reminding us that the essence of justice is impartiality. So we hear a lot about justice today, but not always what it's rooted in. And then finally, the fourth one was fortitude or courage. And it's probably not surprising to you, I like to turn to the patron saint of evangelicalism, which is kind of ironic in itself, but C.S. Lewis. Uh, C.S. Lewis was so good on courage. And I think part of that came from the fact that he was in trench warfare in World War I, so he knew what it took to actually fight and the courage that you needed on those front lines in a tragic war. And so he had a lot of time to think about it, write about it, reflect on it. And a lot of it comes through his nonfiction writing. And a lot more, I think, even comes through in his fiction writing. He knew how to take these concepts and weave them into these narratives to teach us something beautiful about these virtues. But listen to this. Lewis argued that courage in many ways is the chief virtue. So if I'm right, and we're not talking a lot about courage today, and C.S. Lewis calls it a chief virtue, why does C.S. Lewis think that? And he says this, you will notice, of course, that you cannot practice any of the other virtues very long without bringing fortitude into play, without bringing courage into play. Any virtue you can think about, It will take courage to actually use that virtue. Courage is like the activator. So think almost like a diabetic and glucose and they need insulin in order to open up the cells to bring gospel courage, or in that case, glucose into the cell. We need courage to activate these. You cannot have love, rightly ordered love, love that goes against what this world says love is without courage. You're not gonna be able to exercise true justice in a world that calls for it in a thousand different ways, but you say, this is what the Bible says justice is. That's what I'm gonna do. That's gonna take courage. If you want to have temperance in our day, it's going to take courage because you've got to stand in the stream of culture that's pushing against the call for temperance. And then you think about the Christian virtues, faith, hope, and love, and those certainly you will not have and you will not use if courage is missing. We can't miss this step. We can't miss it. And in times of confusion and chaos, if we're honest with ourselves tonight, we don't know when to speak. We don't know what to speak. We don't know how to speak it. I know I find myself paralyzed a lot of times thinking, should I say something right now? Should I not say something? Is, is it more courageous not to say? Because sometimes not to speak is the best action we could take. Or is it more courageous to actually speak into that situation? What do we say? We're walking on eggshells. Everything we say feels like we're tiptoeing through a landmine field, doesn't it? And so courage is what it's going to take to know and to step out and to speak. And we need to reorient ourselves on the message of the gospel Because when we see this in in the New Testament, courage is attached to the preaching and the teaching and the speaking of the gospel. And it's gonna take battlefield-like courage. And that's why I love to turn with you to 2 Timothy chapter one, because Paul is sitting here, you know this, he's, he's in his jail cell, he's awaiting execution. And he's writing to his son in the faith. And he's scrawling out this final letter. What I love about 2 Timothy is is this uh, urgency in the letter. Paul's really got to get this through. The last thing, this might be the final time I talk to my son in the faith. And I want to give him a message. These four chapters in 2 Timothy are just loaded with battlefield advice. 
for what Timothy is going to need to be courageous because the mantle of leadership is passing. Paul knows it. It's coming from me to you. There's plenty of pastors I even see here tonight who are older in the faith. They know the mantle is passing onto this generation. Many of you today knowing it is going to take lion-sized courage to stand in this day. Courage that they did not even have to exercise in their day is what we're going to be called upon to have in the future. So let's listen to Paul's urgent message. He begins, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. In these first seven verses, Paul is telling us to have courage, we must fan into flame the gift. Fan into flame the gift. And he shows us, Paul does in verse four, how he steals everything from John Piper. It is the joy that he wants to have full in himself, that he wants to see Timothy Again, and I I love this charge he's already giving. Timothy, you can see it like a father laying his hands on his son. Timothy, it's going to take every last bit of courage you have. I know you're scared. I know you see me in prison. I know you've heard the stories of the apostles killed. How many times did Paul tell the story to Timothy about that one time he held these coats while they stone Stephen to death. And he's saying, I, that, that's gonna be me, that's probably going to be you, and you're calling people to put faith in Christ right now, and it might cost them everything. But it's gonna take that kind of courage. Timothy, it's gonna be difficult, you'll lose friends. Timothy, people in your church will leave because they have to wear masks. Timothy, people will leave in your church because they misunderstand the significance of Christ's teaching. People are gonna leap, right? You, you see in our day even, things that have not even risen a lot of times to the level of church splits have reached that level. And Timothy, Timothy is fighting life and death issues. Timothy is gonna take a lot of courage to preach the gospel in his day. And that's why Timothy must fan into flame the gift. So I love this image, right? He's, he's almost like a flickering little birthday candle that's got that little bit of a flame on it. And Paul says, we need to take that and through courage, fan it into a conflagration that's going to allow you to preach at this significant church here in Ephesus. And you gotta reach these people with the gospel of Christ. You must fan into flame the gift. That's the main point of those verses there. Paul's calling on him to do that, but he's not alone in doing this. Paul has led him. Paul has mentored him. He's been his spiritual father. He's poured into him. And he's going to need a big dose now to preach the gospel with courage. But what does he say? Four, verse seven, God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. God did not give us a spirit of fear. So if he didn't give us a spirit of fear, what did he give us? A spirit of courage. Like that's the whole point. Paul's saying it's not a spirit of fear. Well, Timothy's not like, well, it's not a spirit of fear. Who knows what it is then? No, he knows. Paul's whole point in saying it's not a spirit of fear is that it is a spirit of courage. It's a spirit of boldness. It's a spirit that's lit by the Holy Spirit to give him the boldness he's gonna need to preach and proclaim the gospel wherever he is going. Paul wants Timothy to grow in this gift. It's, it's the first part of being called out for this task and it's just like you. So when I read 2 Timothy, I see a lot of Timothys here. I see a lot of people who are on the, the front side of their ministry and maybe people have been leading you in the faith, they've been encouraging you, they've been pouring into your life. 
And now they're saying it's, it's time for you to step out. It's time to walk into this space and you need to fan into flame this gift and this calling. It's why I love what I get to do. If I, if I left Phoenix Seminary, I think it'd be to go back into pastoral ministry, to be back on those front lines. I get jealous when we send these graduates out who get to go do it and I'm back in the resourcing tent, I'm the quartermaster, like giving out supplies. It's like, go get them. And I miss the front lines of ministry where Paul is telling Timothy that's where he's going to be and he doesn't have a spirit of fear, he's got a spirit of great boldness and courage. And because we have the spirit, we should have courage. I think there's a link Paul's making. We don't have a spirit of fear. Paul gave us, or God gave us a spirit of courage. And so this isn't like some of you here today, let's do a spiritual gift inventory. Who's got the gift of courage? Great, the rest of you can be weak-willed. You can be soft. You don't have to stand strong in the stream of faith because you don't have the gift of courage. Not what he's saying at all. Courage is not the icing on the Christian cake. It is fundamental to what it is to be a Christian. You're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. Because you have the Holy Spirit, that's not a spirit of fear, it's a spirit of courage. And so it reminds me of what is listed in Revelation 21. So you remember these great scenes at the end of your Bible, and this is what it's going to look like when God begins to judge people and send them into the lake of the fire. So it's the second death. Have you ever noticed what the very first sin mentioned of those who will be cast into the lake of fire is cowardice. Cowardice. Well, I don't hear that usually used a lot. We talk about a lot of sins today. We think about a lot of things that are going to send people away from the kingdom of heaven. But cowardice. And the second one is like it. It's faithlessness. And it bookends Revelation nicely. Remember chapters two and three, and it's the letters of Jesus to the churches of Asia Minor, and in all of those, it is to the one who overcomes, I will give him the crown of life. To the one who stands, to the one who endures to the end, I'm gonna give that person the opportunity to eat from the tree of life, which means that the person who doesn't overcome, the person who doesn't stand, the person who doesn't endure, the, the outcome is obvious. They are not going to be eating from the tree of life. Courage is life and death. Courage is heaven and hell. And so Paul wants Timothy to fan this into flame, to take that flicker. Maybe that's what you feel like tonight. Maybe, maybe you're here and you just say, you know what? When I look at myself, I'm, I'm always too gun shy. I, I don't want to speak. I don't want to offend. I don't want to make people upset. So I just say nothing. Can I encourage you to just fan and to flame the gift? As you do that, God will give you the courage and the boldness to step forward. The second thing I think Paul is saying here is to have courage. Do not be ashamed of the Lord. Verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor me as prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel. By the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do, but I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. So the second point, to have courage, do not be ashamed of the Lord. Notice how he connects these, therefore. Now you all have had hermeneutics, or else you aren't graduating this May. If you don't know what therefore is doing, restart your seminary education. We'd be happy to have you as a student again. Therefore, it's pointing back. So because you have a spirit of courage, now what should you do? He's drawing an inference from this. And because you have a spirit of courage, do not dare be ashamed. Twice in this passage now he says, don't be ashamed. So I'm gonna ask two questions here. What is this gospel of which he is not to be ashamed? 
Second, why does Paul connect preaching the gospel to shame? Why, what, what is it about the gospel that could make it shameful? So first, what is the gospel message of which Paul is saying, do not be ashamed? This gospel message that Paul never tires of preaching. The gospel message is clearly laid out here. I love it when Paul does this. He gets on a roll and he knows he's got stuff to say to Timothy. He knows the parchment's running short, but he can't lift up his pen because he's in glorious rapture of what the gospel is. And he's got to remind Timothy, who knows it really well, hey, remember this. And because you woke up this morning, you need to remember it too. Because we never graduate from the gospel. The gospel is something we need preached into our own hearts and lives every single day. So because Paul felt like saying it again and again, I'm going to say it again tonight. The first thing about the gospel is God saved us. God saved us. We didn't save us. We didn't go on our own rescue mission for ourselves. God saved us. And because God saved us, there should be an inveterate humility in the heart of every Christian on the planet recognizing what God has done for them. He called us to a holy calling, for a holy calling. Holiness is so needed in our day. I think these are linked together. To have courage, you must have holiness as well. And we've seen what happens when those do not go together well. Not by works, but because of his own purpose and grace. This was the glorious rediscovery of the gospel from Martin Luther and some of my church history two students are in here right now. We've just been hammering this and hammering this. We're going again. Because this is the rediscovery that lit the world on fire, not by works, which is the human inclination. We want to think I have some level of boasting. I get to heaven and I get to say, look, I did at least 1%'s worth. And my 1% was better than your 1%. So get behind me. I'm a little closer to the throne because my goodness. And God says, where's your boasting? There's no boasting here because God's the one who saves, not by works, but by his calling. And it's given in Christ before the ages began. It makes you think, hopefully, of uh, Ephesians. Timothy's in Ephesus. And you get that great beginning of Ephesians chapter 1, where Paul talks about how God was planning this out from the very beginning of time. If you skip back again to the book of Revelation, there is a book of life of the lamb that was slain, written when? Before the foundation of the world. Before God created the world, God was already thinking of his saving mission. That people right now would be in a room like this, worshiping and praising him, not because of a salvation they earned or deserved, but because God is a great savior. And he loves saving big sinners. And it's manifested through the incarnation. And if we want to talk about courage, we never have to look much further than the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who had the ultimate courage, who not only created everything, he created the nerve structures that would later cause him great pain on the cross. I mean, he, he brought into being those who would kill him. And he takes on courage and he comes down and he descends into the humility of the incarnation, born of a virgin, laid in a manger, living the perfect life, manifested through this incarnation and he abolished death, brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus killed death. So that we can say, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Jesus saved us, what the author of Hebrews says, from that lifelong fear of death. Look, the world is very afraid right now. And like A.W. Tozer said, a scared world needs a fearless church. And yet there's a lot of Christians just as scared as everyone else in this world today. And we have heaven to look forward to. He abolished death. He brought eternal life to light and immortality through the gospel. What are we afraid of if heaven is where Christ will bring us, whether it's through a pandemic or persecution, we are his. And this is Paul's gospel. This is what animated Paul. This is what got Paul going. Everywhere he went, he wanted to say it over and over and over again. If we think that the remedy to fighting inside the church right now or the fighting that's happening outside the church is anything other than this gospel message, we've missed it. We must always go back to this gospel Paul preached. Paul always goes back to the simplicity of the gospel. I don't care if it's the problem in Corinth. I'm going to preach the simplicity of Christ crucified. 
I don't care if there's the problem in Galatia, he begins with the gospel and says, stop being bewitched. It's always going back to the gospel. There's no other hope for the humanity than the gospel. And my fear is some people in our day seem almost too sophisticated for it. It's always the what's next, as though the gospel itself doesn't even give what the next is. And what that next is is always the humility of recognizing great sinner needing a great sinner, savior who's Christ. That is not the way to go forward. If we're going to have courage, and we're going to have courage like Paul calls Timothy to here, it had best be courage to plant our flag in the blood-drenched soil of Calvary and to stand there. Because sometimes courage is not going out and doing things, it's standing. It's Luther at Worms. Here I stand. I can do no other. The courage of standing for the gospel is always worth it. Paul connects this to courage and he says, I'm not ashamed of it because this is his hope. I, I think about the book of Acts. Think about the book of Acts. How much is courage talked about there and boldness and this desire to go out there and what is it always connected to? Preaching the gospel. Pray for us that we will be bold. The spirit is calling us to go and we, we don't want to get there and shrink back. We want to go and have the, the type of courage that Christ is calling us to. And notice how the very end of Acts goes. Paul lived here, lived there for two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance. Luke drops pen, Acts continues. So we're probably like in Acts 475 right now. And the call is still the same for the church now as it was for Paul then. And it's have the courage to stand up and preach the gospel. Paul wanted that opportunity. Oh, welcome. Come in. Have you heard about Jesus? And Paul several times connects this even in our passage to shame. So let's move to that question. Why would Paul connect the gospel to shame. And, and one of the verses we all know really well, Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation of all who believe. Jews first and then the Gentiles. Why shame connected to the gospel? This one is always perplexing. In fact, for me, this is one of the greatest arguments that our faith is true. Because we had to go around and tell people, man, your life is broken and you're in ruin, and sin is destroying your life. Can I tell you about this guy who's God in the flesh, who loves you so much, he would take your sin on himself, and he would die an excruciating death, and he rose again. He, he killed death through his cross and resurrection, and you can know new life. You can have peace with God through this. And what do they say? I'm going to kill you for that. Is that an amazing apologetic for the faith that as we preach Christ crucified, people want to kill you for it? So I think Paul has to say this because he knows our tendency to shrink back when things get uncomfortable. And what concerns me today is we are dealing with a modicum of a level of being uncomfortable and people are shrinking back. So it makes me wonder what happens when the real stuff starts? We could take a page out of our sisters and brothers across the world who are facing real persecution in the 1040 window for following Jesus. They know what it's going to cost and they follow him anyway. And when it comes to so many of us today, the smallest little thing, we shrink back. But Paul knows that that's our tendency will be to shrink back. If you're listening to nothing else tonight, this is my like wake it up moment, all right? One of my greatest fears for evangelicals in the coming years is that we'll move from orthodox doctrine not because we have a change of heart, but because we're ashamed of the Lord's testimony. Make no mistake about it, the first step towards doctrinal infidelity is embarrassment of the Lord's testimony. And I think this is happening all the time. I wanna give you a couple of examples. The first one being hell. I am so tired of pastors getting up to preach and it's a passage that deals with sin or hell and they just kind of say, hey, come on, let's bring in close today. You know, 
I wish I didn't have to talk about this today. We got to talk about <clears throat> hell. Um, and I wish it wasn't in the Bible. I, I wish we could just take that out, but it's there. So we got to say something about it. And then they go on to say almost nothing about it. Do you know who never did that? I even heard somebody say it. Jesus. Jesus never did that. He wasn't like, guys, it's a hard message today. We're talking about hell. I wish it wasn't there. Who created it? Jesus. So he warned people of it. There is a broad road that leads to destruction. Many people are going to find it. Jesus wasn't embarrassed to tell people that there's hell, that there's going to be wheat and tares and they're going to be collected up and the wheat's going to come into the kingdom and the tares are going to go into hell. Jesus didn't shrink back from that because he knew by preaching that to people, they would come alive spiritually and they would give their hearts to God. We ought not be ashamed of the Lord's testimony, thinking we know better about what to tell people than Jesus did. Second one's going to be a little bit more uncomfortable than that. And I think it's on the issue of gender. And here I'm especially thinking of things like complementarianism. And we can talk about the other gender issues happening today in mass. The crisis of our age is anthropology. People don't know what people are. They've forgotten what does it mean to be made male and female in the image of God. And I doubt there's many people in this room right now who are really struggling with, with uh, what to believe the Bible teaches about transgenderism. I don't think that's where people are. But I do think people are shifting from a biblical view of gender. So let me just ask you, are you embarrassed that there are gender distinctives in Scripture? Are you embarrassed that God gives some roles to men and some roles to women? Almost nothing will make us look as backward as misogynistic, as bigot, as this kind of teaching today. And so I see people say, let's not talk about that. Let's go easy on those things. When it's God's design, are we embarrassed by what God has said on these things? The temptation is always to sand down the rough edges, make us seem a little less weird. It's steps of compromise, and pretty soon those steps of compromise leave us a pretty far way away from where Christ is and the way I, I see this happening is how often we, we approach this with the camouflage of concern. And we, we try to say, you know what? I just, I want to see people saved, so I'm not going to talk about these things. When again, Jesus says, no, we're going to talk about hell because that might be exactly what gets people saved. We are, we are in a, a real danger of being kinder, humbler, gentler than Jesus. I, I just get these vivid uh, ideas, these portraits in my mind that come up and it's Jesus and let's say he's on the road with the rich young ruler and he comes up and he says, hey, how can I be saved? Every pastor wants to hear that. Every Christian, we don't get that that much, do we? Hey, how, can you tell me how to be saved? That's like on the T. Jesus, this is easy. Open up the pamphlet. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Number two, man is sinful and separated from God. Therefore, he cannot know, right? And you should be working through the four laws, Jesus, that doesn't get easier. And Jesus is like, okay, let's, let's try this. So um, do good, right? Obey the commandments. Oh, I've done all those. Jesus, again, this is so easy. He needs like evangelism explosion training over here. It's like, then he's there. Just say like, I, I believe I'm a sinner. Yes. I want eternal life with Jesus Christ. Yes. We're in. And Jesus is like, not that simple. Go sell everything that you have. And he leaves sad. And I think there's so many in our day that would be like, come on, Jesus. Pull him aside. Give him a talking to. And just say, why, why would you do that? You just put an obstacle in this person getting saved. And Jesus said, no, the guy had an obstacle in his life of getting saved. And I exposed it. And that took courage. And it took the possibility of rejection. And that's what happened. The rich young ruler goes away sad. I think Jesus probably goes away sad in that story too. Jesus would have loved to see the rich young ruler say, have it all. It's yours. I just want to follow you. I, I don't want these things to be an obstacle to, to eternal life. But he walks away sad. And Jesus was okay with that. We cannot have a Christianity in which we think we are coming across better than Jesus. 
So let me just ask. I mean, we, we could do this with a ton of different doctrines. This, this is even what happened in church history. People got embarrassed of the doctrine of the Trinity during the Enlightenment, so they became Unitarians because that seemed easier. And that led to death of congregations. Every doctrine at some point is going to cause people embarrassment. Where is it for you? What doctrine is it when you've got to talk about it with people, you think, man, I kind of wish that wasn't there. Because all of us have them. All of us are uncomfortable somewhere. And that's more about us than it is about Scripture. So what do we do with this? Let's move on to Paul's, the third thing here. Practice what I'm going to call convictional charitable courage. Verse 13, follow the pattern of the sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. So how do we practice convictional charitable courage? First, it's convictional. Follow the pattern of sound words. And then he says, guard the good deposit. Follow the pattern of sound words, guard the deposit. There's nothing to reinvent here. Be faithful to the sound words we receive. This is a glorious thing about our faith. I was asked one time by a family member, what is new in theology? And I said, heresy is new in theology. And my dad was like, you know what he means. And I was like, heresy is what is new in theology. Because it is. It's a faith once for all delivered to the saints. Our job as a seminary is to get you into that stream that has existed all the way back to Christ and David and Moses and Adam and Eve in the garden. Like our job is just to say, this is what we've received. This is what we're passing on. All you got to do is put on the mantle and be faithful in your generation. We're not reinventing anything. I think what we need is what T.H.L. Parker said of John Calvin's theology. His theology was fundamentally so old-fashioned that it seemed like a novelty. If we search out the doctrine that the church has held to, clung to for 2,000 years, there's going to be a whole lot of people in our day and age saying, that sounds new. No, it's not. It's the old paths, and we're walking in them, and they're well-trod by the saints who have gone before Europe just changed when people like Luther and Calvin just said, you know what Paul said? He just says, be justified by faith alone. You open up this word and you say what it says and you don't try to be novel, this world's about to get changed. And then we don't budge. We, we guard the good deposit given. But the second piece is charitable. We cannot miss what, God, uh, what, what Paul says, what the Lord says through Paul in this passage. Follow the pattern of sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. That's not just like a throwaway clause. In the faith and love that is in Christ Jesus. Any sermon on courage these days needs this note of caution. And maybe you've been mishearing me this whole time. Courage is not a replacement word for bullying. Courage does not mean we meet, need more discernment bloggers in our day. I'm not asking you to grab your phone, turn on Twitter, find the newest debate, throw down and just say, look how courageous I am. I don't have a spirit of fear. That's not what I'm saying. There's a faux courage in which people simply pander to the crowd they want to be in with. I'm not advocating that. True courage in our day is going to make you homeless a lot of times. To where the things that you know you need to say that are true from God's word will not allow you on either of the poles of conspiracy theories or critical theories. We need God-shaped granite courage hewn from faith and love. Not a courage is just a synonym for anger. That's not what we're going for. But one that's just full of love. I mean, that takes the most courage. It's easy to throw down and get some applause from the people that you know will like what you said. It's way harder to know that you're going to have to steer a course between a lot of different things if we're going to stay faithful to the word of God. So conviction and charity are not opposites. They're complements, and we need both. And when we have stood with convictional charitable courage and we preach faithfully, we teach faithfully, we counsel faithfully in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll be able to say what Paul says at the end of this letter. I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. I've finished the race. I want to return to where we kind of began with C.S. Lewis, give him the last word. 
Because this fiction, like I said, is rife with examples of courage. And one very poignant example stands out in the voyage of the Dawn Treader. And there's a scene where Drinian and Caspian and Lucy and a few others are on the boat and it's getting tossed about. They're kind of in this vortex and it looks like all hope is gone. And Lucy, and it's always Lucy, isn't it? I love how Lewis does this because God loves to take what seems small and insignificant and show his weight through it. And she whispers into the void, Aslan, Aslan, if we ever, if you ever loved us at all, send us help now. And soon the albatross was seen overhead guiding them in the way. And Lucy alone heard the reply that her heart had longed for. Courage, dear heart. Courage, dear heart. After a season of suffering that our family went through, a sweet lady in our church bought us a print that just says, courage, dear heart, hanging on our refrigerator door right now. I look at it every day. When I face the challenges that even come with this position, the challenges that we face as Christians in this society, it can really boil down to courage, dear heart. And courage will cause us to bend the mast in the high headwinds of culture, but we can never lower the sails. Brothers and sisters, what we need is the voice of Aslan over all of this, reminding us, even through the Apostle Paul, courage, dear heart. Let's pray. Father, I'm I'm most keenly aware of how flat a sermon like this can fall if it's not lit on fire by your spirit. So God, I pray that you'll take a meager attempt but that you will use your spirit to fan and to flame the gift, fan and to flame courage that's gonna be so desperately needed for my brothers and sisters here today as they seek to preach the gospel and teach the gospel and counsel the gospel and live the gospel in this wicked generation, that they will stand as bright lights. There'll be cities on a hill pointing people to salvation in Christ in whose name we pray, amen.